Swashbucklers, you're listening to Under the Crossbones, episode number 103. My name is Phil Johnson. I'm your host for the show. Thank you for tuning in and telling friends and leaving reviews and helping me keep the old barge afloat here. Here we go. My guest on the show today, fun guest. Fun guest. My guest is author Richard Zacks. He is the uh, author of The Pirate Hunter, The True Story of Captain Kidd, which is a great book, and The Pirate Coast, Thomas Jefferson, The First Marines, and The Secret Mission of 1805, which is all about Barbary pirates, uh, which is a story that we don't uh, we don't always hear enough about. And it's a really, uh, really good one. He's also got a book out about Mark Twain and another one about uh, Theodore Roosevelt, and he's got a book called The Underground Education. He writes great Fun, 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 fun book. So we're going to talk to Richard Zacks today, and you are going to dig this interview. Uh, episode 103, fun fact about the number 103, it's the emergency telephone number for ambulances in Belarus, India, and Ukraine. So if you happen to be in Ukraine and you need an ambulance, now you know, right? You never know when dumb little facts like that are going to come in handy. Uh, it could be maybe a bar trivia night. Uh, right? You're doing trivia, your team is there, and they go, what's the number to call for an ambulance in India? And you go, 103. Or maybe you're bleeding on the street in the Ukraine and you need an ambulance. It could happen. You never know. So uh, we spent, I spent uh, the weekend, mostly a good chunk of the weekend, car shopping with my girlfriend because she is looking for a new car. And because uh, her car is 20 years old. It's, yeah, it's almost 20 years old. She's driving a 98 Honda Civic. Uh, and, uh, she doesn't do a ton of long distance driving like I do. So it's not even like like the high mileage, but it's just time. The thing is starting to fall apart. So we go car shopping over the weekend so she can test drive a few things that she's interested in. And, uh, she wants to get, uh, like a RAV4, uh, or like a, you know, mini SUV type of thing. Cause that's her jam, whatever. I don't like them. I think they look like a, a shoe. But uh, <laughs> that's what she wants. So cool. But there is this liberation to car shopping with somebody when you don't when you don't you don't have to pay for it. Like I'm not paying for it. She is paying for it. It's her deal. I just go along for the test drives, and she goes, "What do you think?" And I go, "Yeah, it's cool." And she goes, "Which trim should I get?" I don't know. Get the most expensive one. It's got the most toys in it. And uh, so it's just like totally liberating. I was totally along for the ride. And not having to make any consequential decisions, uh, which is uh, which is kind of nice. I did actually give her opinions. We drove a, a Mazda uh, CX-5, something like that, and it's got like a heads-up display, right, where it, it uh, projects your miles per hour and stuff onto the windshield. And it was, I thought it was going to be like really like easy to see. And I sat in the driver's seat and I was like, oh, it looks, I had to like, change the focus of my vision it was almost like one of those posters where you have to like blur your eyes to see what's happening it wasn't super effective i i don't think i would uh i would be happy as an owner of that necessarily but uh so anyway we're trekking around and she's playing with all the toys in the cars and traveling around and uh and as as un uninvolved as i am not uninvolved i'm there i'm giving opinions and things like that but like i said this is her money she's buying this car I really have nothing to do with this process except for just being there and helping her, uh, you know, give her opinions and things like that. But then I start going, oh, man, I bought a car like a year too early because they all have such cool gadgets now. Like in a regular, like a decent price range, they have like adaptive cruise control where it'll the, the car will slow down and speed up and you just set it on cruise control. It's almost very robot driving, very almost driverless. They've got like lane assist where if you drift over, it'll pull you back in your lane all these cool things that I do not have in my car. And they apparently like showed up like just like a year or two after I bought my car. My car's only three years old and I like my car, but it doesn't have all those cool uh, robot gadgets in it. I use my cruise control all the time. Man, would I love to have adaptive cruise control? So I started, I'm sitting there in these cars. I'm like, Oh, maybe I should, what's my car worth? Maybe I should trade it in and get a new one. And I did the math and I would still end up having to drop like 10 grand on top of what my car is worth. And so you just go, oh, I'm gonna guess I'm going to have to drive her car once in a while if I want to play with the, all the toys and stuff. But she hasn't bought one yet, but it's coming soon. She's planning. She's strategizing as to when she's going to buy. Uh, she There was a good financing deal that's up at the end of the month. But at the same time, she was like, maybe, maybe the day of New Year's Eve we go shopping. Because when the, then the sales guys are like all desperate. They got to hit their monthly and their annual quotas. And she's like, they'll give it to you. And. I don't know if that works or not, but that's that's her plan. So that's that was our weekend was car shopping. 
uh, and me just along for the ride. Literally, that's that's how it worked. So, but uh, uh, this week, busy, busy, busy. I'm headed off to Colorado Springs this weekend, Thursday through Saturday. I will be at Looney's Comedy Cafe in Colorado Springs. I'll be featuring for the fantastic Kristen Key, uh, who's also a musical comic. So it is going to be guitar hilarity for five shows, Thursday through Saturday at Looney's in Colorado Springs. So if you're in the area, come out for that. Uh, Sunday, uh, August the 20th, I'll be headlining at O'Malley's in Mountain View, California. And then Wednesday, August the 23rd, I'll be headlining at the Wind River Casino in Redding, California. August, always a light month for gigs, but picking some stuff up. I just booked some Minnesota and Wisconsin dates today. Lots of good things coming up. If you want to get all my tour dates, come uh, to uh, go to underthecrossbones.com. Click on the tour dates button, and you will see all the places I'm going to be. Orlando, Florida, coming for you guys in November, November 3rd to 4th. Lots of good stuff coming up. If you're enjoying the show, and I hope you are, come on over. Join us on Facebook. That is at facebook.com slash under the crossbones. On Twitter, we're at under crossbones. No the in that one. And make sure you subscribe to the show, of course. Uh, uh, Stitcher, Slacker, Google Play, iTunes, Podcast Addict, podcast, what, Overcast, whatever you use to listen to podcasts, just click that subscribe button next to the show. And then you get all the new shows just automatically every Tuesday morning. It's just that easy. If you want to help support the show, that would be awesome of you because it costs me money. I lose money on this show. It's all right, though. It's, I, I enjoy doing it for you. I do. And uh, But here's how you can support the show. Go to underthecrossbones.com slash support. There's a little PayPal donation box there if you want to uh, you put in whatever amount you want. Uh, tiny, small, big, doesn't matter. Uh, however many digits uh, you think are appropriate for your donation. Go in that PayPal box. Uh, otherwise, click on the Amazon banner there. Buy yourself something nice at Amazon. It's hot. Maybe, maybe buy a, a, one of the, a blow-up pool for your backyard. Uh, maybe some uh, water wings to wear in the shower. Uh, whatever you buy at Amazon, they'll kick me uh, a couple shekels back if you click that banner over there. And I appreciate that. And, of course, anytime you click uh, to uh, through the show notes to buy somebody's book or album or whatever that I've linked there, that's helping the show as well, too. I get a little kickback on those. So always nice to see those. If you want to be a sponsor of the show that's cheap and easy, just go to underthecrossbones.com slash support. All right. Let's dig into my very fun interview with the author, Richard Zacks, and his books about pirates and Mark Twain and sex and weird stuff. Oh, there is a little bit of sexy talk in this one. Not like we're romantic with each other, but there's a there's a little bit of naughtiness so in places. Not no overt, but enough if you got kids in the car. All right, here it is, Richard Zacks. Here we go. You're an interesting author because I've read a bunch of your books, but I did not realize that the books I'd read were all by you, <laughs> uh, which is oh, weird. That's good. Yeah. So I had read, uh, I know I'd read the, the, I know I've read the captain kid book and I have, uh, an underground education, which somebody gave to me for Christmas one year. So I read that and I'm in the middle of your, um, uh, Mark Twain book. And I hadn't realized until the Mark Twain book, I was like, Oh, these are all by the same guy. <laughs> yeah. It is. You know, most people pick a time period and they become a specialist and I've been sort of all over the map. So, yeah. So, Let's. Well, I want to talk a little bit about that. How? Let's start with the Captain Kid book, um, since it's a piratey type of show. Right. What led you into wanting to write that book about that particular pirate? Well, I, I mean, I have a strange background all over the map. I, um, you know, studied Greek and Arabic and Italian and French and history and all kinds of different things. And then one day, um, an editor popped down on, a, uh, you know, on the top of a bar, everything you don't know about history, uh -huh. which wound up becoming an underground education, which included a story about how Captain Kidd wasn't really a central casting pirate. Okay. You know, he, he gave this, this was the most impossible book assignment ever. It's basically like one up the historians in all the major fields, you know, science, art, um, literature, whatever. So I just kind of went nuts for about two years, just looking for all these kind of stories. And one of them happened to be Captain Kidd which I thought was probably the most promising one to turn into a narrative history book. So um, I basically found the story and realized that he was a privateer hired to chase pirates. And, um, and then that book took almost three years to do. So that became a whole nother adventure. But So what was your, how did you go about finding that story? I mean, you had the, the nugget of the story in your, cause the captain kid book is your what, third book, I think. Right. So how did you, so you had that little nugget from the previous book, what was your what did your research process look like to go actually find the real story out? Well, I I loved doing the research for that book. This was kind of, this was a total breakthrough for me because I had been a journalist. I had a syndicated column that was in about fifty million circulation. You know, a whole bunch of newspapers. But I always wrote short, and I was always a wise guy. And then 
I tried taking on this narrative history book and I got a nice deal for it. And then I realized, oh my God, this is so much harder and so different <laughs> from what I'm good at. I mean, it was total panic, total panic. And I just, I used books like Robert Ritchie's book. He's a Harvard University professor, good scholar. I mean, I totally disagree with his conclusions about Captain Kidd, but he's an amazing scholar. So I literally went through every note in the back of his book to cross-reference back to where he was researching. You know? oh, okay. And uh, m most of it was the public record office in London, outside London in Kew. Huh. And so I had a buddy who, who just married a London Times reporter and then moved over there and they had an extra little bedroom. And I just moved into the bedroom and I spent a couple months in the public record office, um, you know, outside London. And it was amazing. It just the the primary source material that I found, it was just so totally exciting. You know, it's all handwritten stuff. And the Brits are amazingly generous with it. If you get this card and you get a beeper, like you're at some cheesy restaurant and <laughs> your beeper vibrates and you go in three, three documents from 1699 are waiting for you, you know, <laughs> that's better than Olive Garden. Oh, totally. And they got somebody up there sitting sitting on this high stool who looks over everybody like the, um, the master, you know, with a long pointer and they, <laughs> they whisper to you. And it's just this amazing bunch of quirky Brits sitting in the room with these, some of them are using medieval scrolls. I mean, it's just wild. And, and what I found the big breakthrough for me was I, I, I didn't, re I didn't realize when I got the book deal, I didn't especially want to write about a private, a, a reputable pirate hunter like captain kid. I wanted pirates too. Right. And, you know, I, I mean, that's what drew me. Let's be honest. That's what drew me to it. The, the crazy clothes and the cursing and the, the, the Johnny Depp side of the whole thing. <laughs> and then here I find this reputable guy. And I, I mean, I got to admit, I was a little bummed almost. And then I found Robert Culliford and he was the, the central casting pirate. He was, uh, he was the guy kid was chasing and no one had ever researched him. So it was a blast to just go through the public record office looking for Robert Culliford material. And I wound up getting lots of authentic stuff that no one had ever seen. So and I think that made the book come alive to have kind of someone that's being chased and, and the chaser, you know, and then have the British government in the wings. I think it totally made the book work. Yeah. And, and you wrote it like, uh, and it's, it's been a few years since I read it, but I, if I remember right, you really wrote it like almost as if, if it were narrative fiction, as if it were the story there and not like a dry kind of history. Not that you are known I, for writing dry history by any means. No, no, you're totally right. In fact, I, I, I argued with my editor and I convinced her not to put a table of contents in the book. Oh, really? Which is maybe, maybe the only, <laughs> I didn't realize how outrageous I was. You know, at the time I was just headstrong and a lot younger. I just didn't want a table of contents. I wanted everything to be a suspense and novel and novelistic. I mean, authentic, everything authentic, everything, you know, well-researched, but I wanted it to read like a novel. And so I talked her out of a table of contents, which is maybe one of the only nonfiction history books without one. I think that's great. <laughs> and then I also talked her out of, out of really boring, you know, having that photo well in nonfiction books that everyone kind of looks at, but, but somehow it, it can really make the book seem kind of dry and like schoolwork. Sure. You know? So I, I, I scattered just these little handwritten drawings and authentic letters. We put like four letters in there just to get the handwriting out. Uh huh. And I don't know. I just, I, a lot of choices that I really liked how they worked out. So how long did it take you to wrap your brain around the handwriting? Because that can be so difficult looking at those old, old documents like that. Well, it's kind of interesting because there's two basic um, types of documents. Um, there's either clerks copies or there's the original letters themselves. Uh -huh. The clerks copies are really doable. You'd be surprised, you know, once you get literally in about a four days, you get comfortable with, you know, some of it's like they put the double F for the S and right. they put the, the Y instead of the TH, which is really just that way. I forget the name of it, that little symbol for TH, but it looks like a Y. And, uh -huh. You know, those you start to get really comfortable with, but it's, oh my God, the hand, the, the other people's handwriting, the average, <laughs> the average captain, the, uh, uh, the, those are really brutal. And I had a note, you know, like Robert Culliford, you know, to a widow that I spent, I spent days, you know, I, I am trying to figure out what some of those words were because I just wanted it so badly. I put it on the internet for people to, you know, try and help me with, but uh -huh. we eventually got it. I'm pretty sure we got it right. So nice. That's yeah, because that's that could be difficult stuff to get into. Every time I look at it, I go, man, I really want to read that, but I don't think I have the energy to. <laughs> but you know, I, you know, it's kind of great on some level because Google has um, leveled the playing field for like most scholars. I mean, in a way, it's kind of 
like the stuff I used to do when I did it 15 years ago was so hard. You had to go to the library itself. You had to request a document. You had to, and so, and now with everything being scanned and available, um, it, it kind of made it easy for, I don't know how to put it. People who are, who are kind of lazy or whatever to, uh-huh. to pretend to do a history book, you know, yeah. or to do a half ass history book. But anyway, I, I kind of like that this handwritten stuff's still kind of hard. You know, at least there's something that you got to work out. You know? right. <laughs> Presents a nice challenge anyway. Yeah, definitely. What? Yeah. Uh, so going into it, I, you said you were kind of dismayed that Captain Kidd was actually a, a, one of the good guys instead a of one of the bad guys. reputable guy. Yeah. I was shocked. To, you know, I knew a little bit of that, but I didn't. You know, he bought a pew at Trinity Church. He married one of the wealthiest widows in New York City. He um, He tried to get a commission to be a Royal Navy captain. I mean. This, this, it's just the ultimate irony that he winds up going down with Blackbeard is like two of the, you know, most notorious pirates that any Americans know. Yeah. It's just really ironic. Outside of being one of the good guys, what else did you find surprising about him? Um, well, I, if we got time, I could just tell you a little bit of the, you want a little bit of the story? Yeah, go for it. Yeah. The basic. Sure. Okay. So he basically, like I said, he wanted to be a Royal Navy guy and he, he fought against the French and there was Robert Culliford happened to be a shipmate of his and Culliford goes and mutinies and steals this ship that Captain Kidd is the blessed, blessed William back around 1690. And, um, so now, uh, we have the two of them sort of, you know, basically enemies. And, um, six years later, Kidd succeeds in buddying up to one of the wealthiest New Yorkers named Robert Livingston and Kidd gets a commission to chase pirates and chase uh, the, and fight the French, a legit privateering commission. And it turns out by that point, six years later, Robert Culliford is one of the most notorious pirates in the world. And so basically it's kid out there looking for pirates, including this man who once stole a ship, Robert Culliford. And uh, it's just, kid was, was, was kind of stymied at every turn. He, he, he went out to the Indian Ocean and the English East India Company didn't want to help him at all. They didn't, they considered him an, an interloper. So he's, he's not even getting help from the Brits and oh. certainly the, you know, pirates aren't going to help him. And the Indy, the people who live in India don't want to help him. So he's really this lone ship out there trying to find pirates and uh, capture them to bring back for the Lords. And, uh, you know, it, it's basically a misadventure, but it has, a, you know, there are a lot, a lot of turns. He captures two huge ships that were traveling with French passes. So they were technically legitimate captures. And um, he eventually, uh, I don't know how much to give away. I won't give away the punchline, but he eventually <laughs> finds Robert Culliford on uh, Ile Saint Marie, St. Mary's Island off the coast of Madagascar. Uh-huh. And it's the perfect moment. He can capture him. He can get all his treasure that, that the pirate Culliford has already captured. And he orders his men to attack. And if you read the book, you'll find out what happened <laughs> And there's the cliffhanger. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> Speak, actually, speaking of speaking of Cliff and Cliffhanger, what do you what's your take on uh, Barry Clifford's claim that he's found the adventure galley there out near Madagascar? Well, first, I have to say I really like Barry as a person, and uh-huh. um, I, I don't usually I'm not much of a name dropper. I don't have that many names to drop, but but Bobby Kennedy's fiftieth um, uh, birthday at the Harvard Club, I happened to be invited through my wife, uh-huh. and uh, she's a literary agent, and Barry Clifford was invited also. And Bobby Kennedy actually took time out from his uh, out from his own party to introduce the two of us because we were both into pirates and he really liked you know both our books and all this kind of stuff. So that that's when the first time I met I think I met him under the elephant. They have a stuffed elephant at the Harvard Club. Oh my gosh! <laughs> and it, it's really creepy to see a freaking elephant head on a wall. Let me tell you. <laughs> oh my god. They had a funny story with that too. They were um, cleaning the elephant, and uh-huh. um, you know, because it got so dusty, and whatever cleaner they used turned the thing pink. Oh no! <laughs> so it was. Yeah, they had a pink elephant on the wall of the Harvard Club, and they literally had to take like this gray wash and try and get it back to looking like a gray elephant on the wall. <laughs> but, um, That's hilarious. There, well, there's probably a lot of drinking there. Yeah, Clifford was great, and I really liked him as a person. But we disagree on the adventure galley. That's, oh, yeah. that's, okay. uh, I just I just have eyewitnesses who say that the ship was leaky as hell and they had to burn it down to the what the water line and salvage it for all the metal parts that were aboard. And huh. I just do not think it's in the uh, harbor in, in St. Mary's Island. Um, and then and then I actually worked on the salvage of what I do think is the correct ship. Um, a guy named um, Charlie Beaker of um, Indiana University um, has an underwater um, salvage you know, um, I don't know what you call a department. And uh-huh. uh, Charlie did a thing for National Geographic, and we found 
the ship that kids sailed back in the key to merchant um there there were like 30 cannons lying on the on top of the wood and the whole key was that my documents revealed that the ship was built in surat in india okay so the question would be would that wood um be of indian origin or would the wood be just regular british or north american wood and it was so exciting the the, the chemistry came, the, the chemical results came back and uh, it was indian oh. you know it came from india so we were able to confirm and that was off the Dominican Republic, La Romana. Interesting. And what was your function in that crew? Were you actually diving or were you just consulting? I did. He let Charlie, Charlie, Charlie let me go down, but I'm not a diver. So <laughs> I, I, you know, the good news is it was like 20 foot water, 25 foot water. So okay. um, I went down and I touched the cannon and one of Charlie's professional divers took this picture of me touching it. And so you, you have to, it's almost looking like a sonogram. You have to know what you're looking at to, sure, yeah. to realize that I'm touching a cannon underwater. But, um, you know, I was down there for a week and um, that was very exciting. And we, we made a whole, you know, documentary for National Geographic. So it was fun. Oh, nice. That sounds, that sounds really great. Your other pirate book is um, uh, The Pirate Coast, which is the Thomas Jefferson and the, the Marines going to Tripoli, which is a fascinating story that I don't think gets told enough. Uh, and uh, so tell, tell me a little bit about that book. Well, that one also, um, I think that also came out of underground education, the mis, the, uh, you know, misconceptions about the Barbary pirates. Uh-huh. And, um, I, I love doing the research for that one too. That, uh, I found, um, again, it, uh, to me, it always boils down to the research. And, um, I, um, uh, the basic story is that, uh, we were a, a fledgling nation with almost no budget for a Navy and that we had, uh, we, we were being, our merchant ships were being captured by the four Barbary states, you know, in North Africa, uh-huh. you know, um, Tripoli and Morocco and uh, we, and Algiers. And we we didn't like that at all. So we send over a Navy ship, um, Philadelphia, and it winds up getting beached in the harbor of Tripoli. It, it's the guy, Captain uh, Bainbridge, uh, accidentally beaches it. And so we have 300 American host, uh, sailors become hostage. And so this was a story, that basically the first overseas covert op, op by the Marines to the shores of Tripoli. This is that story, you know, and I, I again, it was, I found a document in French by a, um, a Dutch diplomat and uh, from Tripoli, giving a whole new perspective on what had actually happened. It was, this basically ran counter to a lot of American history books. So that was, that was really fun, you know, and again, it was in the research, you know, finding that document. So. And I told that story too, tried to tell it, you know, in more of a novelistic style. It's a triple weave, the Navy trying to do the rescue, this covert op trying to do the rescue and the diplomat, Tobias Lear. And I kept weaving in the three storylines and, you know, so the reader doesn't know which of the three is going to succeed or not succeed. And, uh-huh. You know, that was a fun one to write. So. Yeah, there were a lot of... Um counter operations uh, the right hand not lo- knowing what the left hand was doing through that entire experience because um, the stuff that i've read on it because uh, yours uh encompasses like a couple of years and the the other books i've read on it encompass you know 30 years and so you've really centered it yeah. just on that one op that's what i i just have um i don't know obsessive compulsive disorder so <laughs> i just want to see the whole book on two days if i could I just, I just can't handle, you know, all these windy generalizations about 30 years of history. I just want to find out who, what, where, and when, Yeah. you know, and uh, focus in. So a couple of years is plenty for me. Some guy at Fox News actually uh, had a ghostwriter and basically retold my story um, and got a huge bestseller out of it. I'm not naming his name, mostly because I blocked it out of my brain, but <laughs> um, somebody rewrote, rewrote my book. He's a Fox on air guy with a, with a ghostwriter. Wow. And, um, and got a massive bestseller. Yeah, I know exactly yeah. what you're talking about. So I got all these fan letters of out, from outraged fans, and I said, there's nothing I can do about it. It's history. You know, anyone can take a history book, you know, and there's no plagiarism of the words. So right. that's nothing I can do. Yeah, no, I, I know exactly the book you're talking about. Um, do you think that those uh, that that time period in that part of the world is still affecting us now with all the stuff happening there? I would think so. I mean, we had a great opportunity to uh, sort of build – some long lasting friendships. And <laughs> instead we pulled out, you know, I mean, I'm not saying it was right to take the, the older brother who was a little crazy and put him on the throne uh, over the younger, more vicious brother, but we would have built a relationship and maybe that relationship would have lasted. Uh, but this, this just, people got massacred. This was a, this was a true b- betrayal, you know? So this yeah. wasn't good. Yeah. It's an interesting story, and I don't. I think it doesn't get told enough. And I also think when it does get told now, it's being told from 
from a uh, a perspective that has an agenda, uh, like like Fox News guy there, who his book definitely had an agenda um, of of yeah, see, demon. I didn't, I didn't read it. Yeah, no. it was. Uh, Tell me, what was the agenda? Well, it's the agenda is sort of demonizing that whole part of the world uh, by by playing yeah. them as the enemy at all times. When there was then there there was stuff like that on both sides. There were mistakes made on both sides. Right. Absolutely. That, yeah. Absolutely. And Jefferson, Jefferson, I mean, covertly wanted was willing to pay ransom just so long as no one would know about it. So right. that makes us pretty duplicitous too. So uh, yeah, yeah. No, it was it, it was pretty ugly. But the, the idea of having an entrenched system of piracy, part of anyone who's non-Muslim, you're allowed to attack their ships unless they pay tribute. You know, that that is extortion. I mean, that's right. pretty bad behavior. <laughs> you know. Yeah. <laughs> now, what I think is interesting, though, is your your first two books were, like you said, very short form, nuggety kind of uh, books, which is great because you can dip in and out of them. There's, you know, if, if you got five minutes, you can go into one of those books and check them out. And uh, then you went like completely the opposite direction and took like one tiny little nugget and expanded it to 500 pages. <laughs> so that's a pretty big discipline change. Yeah, I always wanted to write narrative history. You know, I went to Columbia Journalism School, and I knew how to write thousand-word pieces, and I had my own entertainment columns. So I was writing about movies and things like that, and uh, and uh, I always wanted to do narrative history. So, it, and it just about broke me. It was just so I found it so hard to make the the, the leap. And then I was really pleased. You know, Pirate Hunter one. I don't you know we wanted to be a bestseller, and we sold movie rights, and uh-huh. we sold like two hundred thousand copies, and all these really good things happened from Pirate Hunter, and um, but it. <laughs> It was, there was times when I'd say to myself, you know, I can't do this. I'm just going to have to leave my wife and family and go hide. And I used to say to myself, I'm going to be a janitor in Phoenix. <laughs> Richard, you cannot do this. You're going to be a janitor in Phoenix. Accept your fate. <laughs> but, you know, with all due respect to janitors in Phoenix, that's not what I wanted to do. No, certainly, but, you know, being a janitor is one thing, but then condemning yourself to Phoenix is a, a whole yeah, other thing. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> So then when you – your your first book is uh, – which I haven't had a chance to read yet. I've, I've read Underground Education, which I think was uh, really fascinating. And that one is kind of like sort of the unseen history kind of stuff. Right, exactly. And, you know, people have turned those into books. There's like 10, 10 of my stories are now books in there. By the way. Oh, crazy. But, yeah, it seems like yeah. sort of a menu of writing ideas, almost like a writing prompts book, but more interesting. I know. I want to find <laughs> one for myself in there, frankly. I'm telling you. Yeah. <laughs> So the first book, which is all about sex in the ancient world up through Warren G. Harding, apparently, um, what right. was what was the motivation behind that one? Well, I, I, you know, to be honest, I was afraid of this making the leap from journalism to book writing. And I did it kind of in a cowardly way. I, I, I had a really good uh, literary agent and she got me a deal to just do basically a sex anthology. OK, so this is really so 90 percent of that book is quoting from other people you know, other sources, but because I have sort of a quirky man, brain and also because I studied all those languages, a lot of it's stuff that people just never got a chance to see, like, um, I don't know, Joan of Arc's virginity test okay. um, or, um, you know, um, I don't know, uh, I'm trying to think of some of the others, um, Burkhardt of Worm, the penitent, medieval penitential list, like if if you accidentally have intercourse with your sister-in-law in the dark, thou shalt do so many Hail Marys, you know, <laughs> I mean... <laughs> Just things you couldn't even make up. If you if you make a loaf into the shape of a man's member, thou shalt do so many. I mean, you just can't imagine that the medieval mind was, you know, and you find these things, you go, wow, this is so fun and so authentic, you know, or leather dildos in ancient Greece or any any of these things. Anyway. Right. So, so I love this stuff, but it, was, it wasn't as much writing. There was a one I like to say, if thou do it like the leopardess, if you do intercourse like the leopardess on the cheese grater, which I had no idea what that was. And I found a scholarly explanation. I guess the handle of the cheese grater was sort of like a, le- a female leopard with its haunches up in the air. Okay. So if you did it from behind, that meant you were doing it like the leopardess on the cheese grater. <laughs> so <laughs> the cheese know. grater and sex just sounds painful anyway. Yeah, really. That shouldn't be associated with sex <laughs> <Not> at all. <laughs> Oh my God! Yeah, so that one, that one, I gotta get, I gotta get my hands on a copy of that one because it sounds really. It's fun. a little scholarly, but I mean, um, I'm really proud of it, and there's a lot of quirky stuff in there. So, so what do you think the difference was then, going from the style of that first one into the style of underground education, which is very um, casual sort of writing? 
Right. That I, it was just a, a leap towards not doing, you know, basically not living on the work of other people. You know, okay. I mean, it wasn't an anthology, so I had to go and find all these quirky facts, but then I had to put them, and then my, that's where my newspaper column um, background really helped me because I knew how to do, you know, basically write a lead, grab people with the first sentence, you know, deal with the exposition, and then um, come up with a, a, you know, some kind of kicker. And I also really enjoyed. I think I found 200 photographs and illustrations for that book. Because again, the research, you know, back in the day, it was so much harder than it is now. There just wasn't Google images, sure. you know, to pick. Sure. So I was all over the place, you know, and um, and all of those were out of copyright, so I didn't have to pay anything for them. Oh, extra really nice. nice, yeah. <laughs> you know, they were all so old. All these old books, I basically just took photographs of old books, and we just threw them in, and it really worked out. And so, yeah, that was that was more my newspaper background, and that was more in the research and. Um, you know, it was it was actually a really hard book. That one, I don't know. I just have this theme here of like almost cracking up, but it's just I find these things really hard. You know, I'm really proud of them when they're done, but somehow it's always hard for me to get these things done. I don't know. Yeah, no, I completely understand that. I've got uh, at least two unfinished novels sitting in my computer. Oh, I got about five. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I I at least I wrote some. You know, some of these first cha- and I reread them, and the first chapters are fun. I go, why didn't I keep going back when I had these characters in my brain? You know, yeah. I, I was so convinced that it was bad. Maybe it wasn't so bad. I don't know. And so, do do you find that you you kind of want to do some fiction, but it seems harder for whatever reason? <laughs> Yeah, that's the exact moment I'm at right now. I'm not I'm not a young anymore, and if I don't, you know, I have some nonfiction ideas that I'm pretty sure I could get deals for. I'm yeah. um, convinced, but I haven't sent in the proposals because I've been um, been kicking around this really ambitious novel idea, and um, I don't know. I, I just haven't decided. It's, I've been spinning my wheels since January, and I just have to make a decision at some point. I did the research to maybe pitch another pirate book. If I want to do another pirate book, I have, oh. I have everything in line. So I consider that kind of in my back pocket and um, just trying to decide. You know, I mean, I, I'd rather do the novel, but it's like doing a year on spec. I mean, you can't sell novels on proposals. You got to write them. Sure. Are you the type of writer that sits down and writes every day diligently? Or, or are you the guy that has to kind of kick yourself to do it? No, I, um, I love research. So I research like, oh, eight in the morning to, to, you know, whatever, midnight or something. I love the research part, but when it gets to the writing, I usually figure out ways to delay for <laughs> uh, four to six months. Maybe uh-huh. I don't delay daily. I delay over months. I see. And then, but while I'm delaying, I keep writing more and more detailed outlines and more and more like theories of where the character arcs are going and where, where everything needs to be and where, you know, and so it's actually kind of a process. <laughs> and then, and then so when I do finally let myself start after four months of getting mad at myself, I have everything ready. And I write really fast once I write. I mean, it might be, huh. you know, like just six months to write the book. Oh, wow. That but is, it's the yeah. research and the rest of it. Yeah, it's just the, the writing comes quickly once I finally get everything in place. I do it. By the way, I do a single space day by day, hour by hour timeline for these books. Oh, wow. You know, like it's good. Yeah, like it could, the Captain Kid one, I think I have a, had it on my screen here for a second. It's like 400 pages or something of oh like gosh. literally they'll say, here we go. Yeah, August, January 22nd, 1654, 1667, February 14th, 1685, William Cox marriage certificate to Sarah Bradley. William Cox bought, you know, blah, blah, blah. That is crazy detailed. <laughs> yeah, so I, I, and then I have everything in my fingertips and I can see the story. I can see, you sure. know, how to structure it because I, and that's what the kid and Culliff, kid and Culliford. I didn't know that that was going to work so well until I actually did the outline, and saw all the timing was perfect when Culliford is in hiding, when kid is chasing, when kid winds up in prison, when Culliford winds up in prison. The deals that are offered to each of them, you know, all that stuff only became clear when I got the timeline. Done. Interesting. Would so. you use that as a tool for writing fiction? <sighs> I need help on fiction. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I just need help. I can't see. I, I don't like making things up, to be honest. I think I'm more, uh, I mean, to be, uh, well, your sounds creepy. I don't want pervy. I'm not pervy. But <laughs> no, no, I, your, your first book, you're pervy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, maybe I am. I, lo- I like looking at things. I like finding things out. I like digging, you know, and so, so fiction is too much, too much making it up. So then I had this inspiration though. I could um, be like a voyeur on my own life. Uh-huh. But that's basically what a lot of novelists do. They, you know, like the Philip Ross and the top people. I mean, they're, they're interpreting, they're researching their own lives and then amplifying and changing. And 
So that's my latest trying to write. You know, I'm not trying to write a memoir at all. I'm not yeah. not a big enough fish for a memoir. But but I I do a lot of interesting things happen. A lot of misadventures. So I thought maybe if I write them up, that will help me with this novel idea. So nice. Kind of where I'm at. It'll be interesting to see where it goes. So the the Island of Vice. That one I haven't read yet, uh, but it looks interesting because uh, you seem to have a, a penchant for sort of the dark side of things and the 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 weirder side of things. I do totally. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I went to an all boys school, so I didn't have a girlfriend till college. So okay. a lot of pent up something. <laughs> yeah. That makes sense. So I have to read that one. Now I'm in the middle of uh, your Mark Twain book, which I'm so enjoying. Uh, I'm about two thirds okay. of the way through it, but it's that, it's that same thing. I have a Mark Twain biography that covers his whole life. That's about 500 pages. And then I'm reading your book, right. which covers about two years and is also 500 pages. <laughs> so there's yeah. an amazing amount of detail. Yeah. I, you know what, if I could do Twain over, I think I actually would, would make it a little shorter. Um, he, his material was just so, I mean, it was so much fun to sort of piggyback onto his writing and a lot of, I got access to his notebooks out at Berkeley that haven't been published yet. So oh my gosh. kind of reading, yeah, unpublished Mark Twain and finding, you know, lines like he's, you know, he had like an aphorism, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, what do you have? Christ, if Christ came back today, one thing we know, he would not be a Christian. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, lines like that, that just are not your typical, you know, Mark Twain. And so I got a little caught up and, uh, I think it could have been shorter actually, but, um, you know, I was trying to tell, I like telling, you know, incidents in people's lives. And basically I was trying to tell his, him going bankrupt and then forcing himself to do a stand up comedy tour uh -huh. uh, around the world in order to pay off his debts. And that's basically, you know, the story. And so did you, did you just find out that little piece of information and go, that sounds like an interesting thing to investigate further? Yeah. I knew about his book following the equator that it had come out of his bankruptcy, okay. but I didn't. Um, and I, when I was researching, I think underground education, I found the, I think it's an unpublished Mark Twain line. Um, they promised to let me in on the ground floor. Only there wasn't a ground floor. <laughs> 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 nice. He's so good. I'm I'm really enjoying this book because I do stand up comedy for a living and it's amazing to me how how little the experience has changed in a hundred plus years of of a stand up comic on the stage dealing with an audience. There's so many things in that book where he's learning how to where he's talking about the timing of how to time the laugh in a larger room and you know, just kind of stuff like that where I'm like, Oh my god. Stuff. Yeah, it's the same stuff I go through. I don't have you ever have I, probably not, but have you ever well, yeah. tried stand up? No, no, I've done stand up. Yeah. Oh, okay. And, um, I, amazing, amazing. No, an amazing thing happened. I've only tried it, um, in terms of this book, but I got about 20 gig gigs. I'd call them to, to, to do a, a presentation. And, and nice. I found out right from the first one that people, you know, obviously love the jokes and the humor and it was going over incredibly well. I was just, I mean, I used visuals too, but I mean, I had 200 people in St. Louis. I had 150 up in near Boston. I had, you know, so when you get that, you know, it, the bigger the crowd, the, the laughs are a lot easier because you get enough sure. volume of people. And, uh, you know, and so, I mean, Twain stuff, I, like, here's a joke that I never would think would work at all. It's, it's all about timing. And uh -huh. I even tell people up front and I go, obey your parents when they're present. <laughs> you know, which sounds really, yeah. Sounds like a lame little nothing, but believe it or not, when you get the momentum and you get, you know, people in the room, Twain just was so brilliant with these pauses and these, uh, you know, and his lines are just, you know, they, they, you know, the, what was it? But it was rainy enough. It was too rainy to go to school and just rainy enough to go fishing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You know. it, I think it's such a tragedy that we don't have any audio of any of his performances because, I mean, they've come close with the the, the, the one-man shows that have been done and things like that. Right. But to actually hear that stuff in person would have been amazing. And I've played rooms that he yeah. has played, uh, or at least I imagine That's he's cool. played, because I've played out in Gold Country, California and things like that and all these little old you know saloons that are a 1,000 yeah. years old. And I just imagine him standing in that same place right. telling way better dick jokes than I have. <laughs> <laughs> he was a little, he told cannibal jokes. He told jokes about eating babies. Oh yeah. But he tried to avoid two, two. He tried to not, his, he was afraid of Livy basically. He's afraid of his wife. So he kept it, you know, the, the, the X-rated stuff. He, he has a couple, I mean, I have something about him that he wrote, um, you know, the, this thing about, um, uh, there was a club that he makes this joke about the mammoth cod club and he, he mis purposely misinterprets what the, it's a fishing club, of course, yeah. but he purposely misinterprets that the club will only take men 
men with very large members, <laughs> mammoth cods. <laughs> and he does this whole riff about the thing, you know, and it's, it's really good. Something he sent it to this millionaire, H.H. H. Rogers, so that, cause he couldn't make the, um, the, the initial part of a voyage that Rogers was treating everyone to. So he gave Rogers the text of the speech and he said, if people are drunk enough, you should get some laughs. Right. And he does a whole riff on basically dick jokes. <laughs> <laughs> See, the more you drink, the funnier we are. That has always been true. Yeah. Yep, that's fascinating. Yeah, so I'm really enjoying that book a lot because uh, I think you, as a as a comic, you get even more out of it than a normal reader would because there's so many things that I can relate to in that book. Well, I had a cool thing happen, uh, if I can name drop again. Jimmy yeah. Buffett sent me an email and asked me um, where in New Zealand uh, Mark Twain would be performing. Oh. Uh, where, I'm sorry, where in New Zealand he was, but he uh-huh. did perform. And so Jimmy Buffett had a gig in New Zealand and chose two of the places that Twain had performed. And um got on the stage and wrote me a little email and said how thrilled he was to go do it and how excited he, cause Jimmy Buffett loves Mark Twain. Yeah. And, uh, he, yeah. So he was, he did it in New Zealand, kind of a tribute to the master. How that neat. Cool. That's really cool. That's really yeah. cool. So yes, I, I recommend all these books to everybody. I've been uh, talking about them as we were, as I was ramping up to talk to you and, uh, yeah, they're really great. So where's the best place online for people to keep track of what you're doing and new projects and things? Um, I've just been terrible because I don't, um, just Amazon or Barnes and Noble or any of the, um, the you know, good reads or in that, but I don't, I haven't really put anything. I have my own richardzax.com, but I haven't really fed the beast. So yeah. um, just cause I haven't made up my mind yet <laughs> to figure out what I'm doing. Well, one other thing I did do, which was fun is I was a historical consultant, um, on, um, the alienist, which is a 10 part mini series that's coming out um, on TNT around okay. Christmas time. I think, I don't know if they have an exact date, but I got, that was a really fun change of pace. I got to be the guy who answers all the questions about like, um, I don't know, dialogue and top hats and policemen's clubs and all that stuff from, um, the Teddy Roosevelt book, Island of Ice. So it's called The Alienist, and that's going to – Caleb Carr's book, really good. Uh, you know, one of the first sort of historical serial killer books ever written. Caleb oh, okay. wrote it like 20-some odd years ago. Yeah. Interesting. Oh, that'll uh, – uh, yeah. my brother will be all over that. He's he's all into the serial killer stuff. Is there another book coming out uh, sometime soon? <laughs> Not as of now. Okay. <laughs> I haven't uh, – I just, I did a year of um, the consulting on the, the historical and um, I do, like I said, I have a pirate idea and then I have this novel and I, don't know, I just, I got to make up my mind. I, I always go through this and then I'll, I'll write it fast once I make up my mind. So there you go. Out. I totally get that, man. Yeah. I totally do. Well, thank you so much for your time. This has been fantastic. I'm really excited to talk to you and uh, I appreciate you coming on the show. Hey, thanks. This was great. Enjoy. All right. I hope we can talk again soon. Sounds good. All righty. Talk to you later. Bye-bye. Hey, take care. Bye-bye. And there it is, friends. That is my interview with Richard Zacks. And, of course, you can find him at richardzacks.com. Uh, Z-A-C-K-S is his last name. And uh, the other uh, social media type of places that he mentioned during the interview. I'll make sure that all that is linked up at the show notes at underthecrossbones.com slash 103. We got some sponsors on the show today. Uh, if you would be nice enough to partake of their services. Uh, I can tell you one thing. As a musician... One thing that is always really tough to find is a good teacher for low-frequency instruments like bass and things like that. There's just not a lot of people around that both can play well and teach well. Uh, But if you happen to be near Houston, Texas, I have a suggestion for you. Jonathan Leon, who is a longtime listener to Under the Crossbones, he is starting a lesson studio to teach electric and upright uh, bass, tuba, tuba, and piano, and his studio is called Making Great Music. Now, you can find him at underthecrossbones.com slash making great music. And Jonathan has the chops, man. He is a musician for 25 years. He's played in the pit for like 19 musicals, which I've done that. That's hard. Studied with uh, um, the amazing Victor Wooten, who's a fantastic bass player. And you need some bass in your life. You need some tuba. You need some piano. Uh, just show, just, If you showed up to a pirate festival blowing a tuba, man, you would be the talk of the talk of the festival. You really would. So you need some tuba lessons and some bass lessons and some piano lessons. Uh, Jonathan takes adults and kids. Everybody's welcome. He's a fellow pirate, so we're keeping it in the family here. That's important. So to get more info and set up some time with Jonathan Leon, go to underthecrossbones.com slash making great music if you are down there in Houston, Texas, and want to get some music lessons. We're also sponsored today by Pirate Radio of the Treasure Coast, WKKC-DB, playing the best music. And Pirate Radio Talk. 
Listen to uh, Under the Crossbones on both their stations. We're there. Just go to Pirate Radio at TheTreasureCoast.com or PirateRadioTC.com. And don't forget to download their apps. That's the Pirate Radio Treasure Coast app, which is their music station, and Pirate Radio Talk, which is their talk station. And they got some new stuff coming up very soon that's going to be very exciting that we'll be talking about here soon. Uh, let's see. What else we got? I have an ebook for you. Alexander Squemlin's Pirates of Panama or Buccaneers of America, which was originally published in 1678. Right there, Golden Age of Piracy, legit info. Uh, Alexander Squemlin was a doctor who uh, managed to find his way onto some pirate ships, probably not by his own choice, and uh, and he uh, wrote about his exploits on those pirate ships. So, uh, easy way. This is a great ebook. I've got a nice copy of it for you. Go to underthecrossbones.com, click on the free ebook button, and you can grab it there. If you're out and about and all you got your phone, just text the word pirate and your email address to 94253. Text the word pirate and your email address to 94253. Okay, kids, that is the end of our show today. Thank you again for tuning in. I super duper appreciate it. If you want to hear more uh, and about Richard Zacks and see what all his books are about and all that kind of good stuff, go to richardzacks.com or find him on the social medias. And, of course, you can find all the show notes for this episode at underthecrossbones.com slash 103. Coming up on the show... In the next couple of weeks, we got more awesome guests. We're going to hear from Dr. E. Lee Spence, who is a shipwreck expert and treasure hunter. Super, man, we had a good talk. Uh, we're going to talk to David McGee, who is the screenwriter of Finding Neverland, uh, the movie. So if you want to get your, your Captain Hook, uh, Johnny Depp talk on, man, we got it in spades right there. And uh, we'll be hearing from Michael Knowles, who is a pirate artist, really good artist, and a uh, former Disney, Disney World guy. Uh, doing lots of work for Disney over the years. So, cool interviews coming up. Make sure that you're subscribed in whatever your podcatcher of choice is. And, of course, you can find all the information at underthecrossbones.com. I'll see you next week. Thanks. Thanks.